I know ha the half-life of caffeine averages to roughly five hours, and the suggested intake is three to six milligrams per kilogram. My question is, what is the suggested dosing for events that last longer than five hours? If I'm competing in an Ironman with a goal of time for or a goal time of 12 hours, how should I go about maintaining my caffeine levels for the back half of the race? Is a 25 milligram gel every 45 minutes enough to stay topped off? Or do I need to ingest another full dosage like before the start of, of the race? <clears throat> this is like the same thing that, um, Nate, I don't know if you remember, but back at Valley of the Sun, we were wondering kind of the same thing. Like how long will this race be? And basically if I take caffeine beforehand, will that give me the sort of benefit for the whole time? Or do I need to keep taking it in? I remember us having a yeah. similar conversation. And I think I told it's you a, to take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 If you we'll talk about sleep. that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, yes, it does. So, so Brian, this is a really good question. And if you haven't come up against this, then caffeine's not on your radar because this is a question that if caffeine intake is a concern for you, if you think you're going to play it to your advantage, you have kicked this question around. Um, the short answer is that the subjectivity of the caffeine response requires experimentation. And I'm just going to come back to that again and again and again over everything I explained coming from this point forward, because that that's how it is super subjective. If we look at the typically recommended range of caffeine intake to, to benefit, you know, to derive an erg ergogenic or a performance enhancing benefit, it's a, it's typically laid down at three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight already. That's a hundred percent range. We're starting at three and then we're doubling it. So that should tell you right, right out of the gates that there's a big range in, you know, how people respond to this. Secondly, all the things that can influence how the caffeine affects you, the source of the caffeine, you know, is it coming from coffee? Is it coming from tea? Is it coming from gels? Is it coming from uh, pill form, et cetera? What is your gene genetic predisposition? You know, what allele of CYP1 or what allele of Adora do you express? Those are things, and there's no shortage of information on those, those very specific things. Uh, smoking affects it, your diet affects it, your liver health, pregnancy, use of oral contraceptives, your training status, uh, the withdrawal effects, something I'll expand on a sec in a second here, the timing of the ingestion, and another thing I'm going to expand on, the time to the peak concentration where it peaks in your blood, uh, your GI response, because I, I guarantee you, Jonathan doesn't tolerate caffeine as well as Nate does intestinally. Mm -hmm. And then the dosing, <laughs> you know, if we're talking 20 to 200 milligrams per hour versus a single 600 milligram megadose, as it's referred to, that that's going to have different effects as well. Also, and this is a big point because the, the, the literature for quite a while focused on how important a desensitization period of time was such that, you know, you, you're not going to get the ergogenic effects of caffeine unless you desensitize yourselves prior to the, you know, the event or, or whatever it is. And then mm -hmm. come to find that, well, there's a balance there. And, 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 and the idea being simply that all the training leading up to your event, if it's done in a caffeine starved, if you will, state, but you're a caffeine habituated person, all those workouts are going to suffer. And therefore your training response is going to suffer as well. So you choose which is worse. Yeah, that's a hundred percent me. I tried this once and it, it was definitely worse for me to lose the benefit of the caffeine on a daily basis. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely, I a hundred percent felt a huge difference when I desensitized myself ahead of a race and then, you know, really kind of slammed a giant Red Bull right before <laughs> a crit. It definitely worked, but I didn't feel like I didn't feel that the benefit on the race day came anywhere close to the benefit that I got in terms of the daily intake. So, and I'm, I'm deeply, deeply habituated to caffeine. So the withdrawal symptoms were really rough. And, and that's a it, really important point because some people, yeah. most of us, I think are habituated to really high levels. We don't recognize it, but when you mm -hmm. go cold Turkey and you had 400 milligrams a day of caffeine on the, on the plate or in the cup, coming off of that, that, I mean, yeah. 400 to zero in a day will have consequences. I assure you yeah. don't do oh, yeah. that. Um, there are ways to get less caffeine. I mean, just less cups of coffee or whatever, if that's yeah. your thing, but also, yes. um, they have like half calf, um, K cups, or, you know, I think they even have beans that are half calf and that sort of stuff, or, um, go caffeinated and then some decaf. I've done that where you, um, go down, even like Kona coffee, when we go to Hawaii, that has way less caffeine. And by the end of that week, I come back to Reno and have a regular cup of coffee. And I'm like, <laughs> bam, I'm like zinging on one, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, do we, are we gonna move on the next question? Cause I have some strong. No, 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 on. we're not on the next one yet. Okay. Cool. So, so let me, let me, let me finish out this one. So let's do some math based on the specifics that Brian provided. 
So if we assume, and I, I've seen the half-life of caffeine range anywhere from five to nine hours, but we're going to pin it at five for the sake of this conversation. So let's say it has a five-hour half-life, and Brian didn't provide this, but I'm going to assume he's a 70-kilogram rider, so 154, 154 four-pound triathlete, which means that at six milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight, so we're going to go to the high end of things, that's a 420 milligram megadose to get things rolling which means five hours into you know, this goal 12 hour time, he still has 210 milligrams of caffeine circulating in his bloodstream. At the 10 hour point, he still has 105 milligrams circulating in his bloodstream. So if he's suppl supplementing as he has, intends with 25 milligram gels every 45 minutes over 20, 12 hours, that's an additional 400 milligrams of caffeine. End of day, that brings his daily total up to 12 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight. That is a heck of a lot of caffeine to ingest over the course of the day. So it may seem innocuous by just bumping this little caffeine intake by 25 milligrams every 45 minutes over something as arduous as an Ironman a triathlon. But at the end of the day, don't plan on sleeping. And you're certainly not going to sleep that night. And I don't think you're going to sleep the next night either. Not to mention <laughs> the toll that the triathlon took on your body and the heightened sympathetic state you're going to be in for a little while. On top of it, mm. you're teeming with residual caffeine in your bloodstream. So- Yet again, this is just another argument in favor of experimenting with this. And no, you're not going to go out and do a 12-hour simulation so that you can figure out how to dial your caffeine, but you know you can kind of make small steps toward calculating what's going to be necessary over something as long as 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's more. There's more, unless <laughs> what you say Please. folds in nicely. Go, Chad, go. <laughs> go, Chad. Okay, so, so just one study, and man, unlike the licking sweat off your body, when it comes to caffeine... <laughs> There is so much information, so much literature, so much research. It is ridiculous. I don't even look at individual studies because you can't throw a rock and miss a meta-analysis of, in this mm -hmm. case, one that I picked is the 2016 review by McClellan and colleagues. They looked at 300 studies. And this was one of seven reviews I found, and it didn't look very hard. And then yesterday, I came across an umbrella review, which is a review of reviews. I mean, they looked at 21 different meta-analyses. So... <laughs> Point being, there's a lot of information on caffeine. Uh, this particular review pointed out a couple of things that I found relevant and interesting. One is that exercise can alter our sensitivity of, of our, or the sensitivity of our adenosine receptors. And that's what caffeine does is it blocks those adenosine receptors and keeps us more alert and affects our, our cognition, et cetera. Tied in with that, postponing caffeine to during or at the onset. So, you know, once you get into whatever your event is or you do it right there standing at the starting line can mean that it has stronger effects on this, on these the sensitivity of your adenosine receptors. So the point is in your case, Brian, maybe you save it for the bike. Maybe, you know, you struggle with the runs, but you postpone it all the way to the run. I don't know, that's for you to figure out, but you're gonna have different effects whether you sit there in the water, warming up for the swim or just waiting for the swim and you ingest your caffeine then, or you do it at the end of the swim or you do it mid bike, et cetera yet another thing for you to experiment with. Mm -hmm. Secondly, this review pointed out that food ingestion slows the absorption rate also. So if you're in the fasted state, they found a strong erg ergogenic effect or a performance enhancing effect. But if you're in the fed state, sometimes they got no effect whatsoever. I'm sure, I'm sure that rel relates to dosage and sensitivity and all those things. But if there's food in the belly, it can affect you very differently than if you're fasted. Again, training experimentation required. And then this is a side note, just a caffeine side note, but uh, in the course of this research, I came across a, a study by Dodd back in 1991, another study by Powers back in 1983. They used three and five milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. Um, the, and the other one, yeah, so, so right in that range. And they use them specifically during ramp tests, so graded exercise tests. So basically what we do every time we assess or try to estimate your new FTP. And they found that caffeine had no effect on performance, not on VO2 hmm. max, not on lactate threshold. Um, I'm sure on perception, but it doesn't matter because the performance didn't change. So even if your perception is a little affected, the outcome of the, the graded exercise test is not. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Hmm. That, is, uh, that is my experience too. Like your maximum isn't any Same. bigger, but if you're going like sweet spot for hours, it just doesn't hurt as much and you can just <laughs> go longer. So I think you, it lets you get closer to where your potential is. Um, mm -hmm. But where the RAM test, it's pretty easy to elicit like your potential because you just fall over. Um, Chad, I think there is something too, if I remember correctly, like there is a minimum effective dose. And I remember studies saying that like you have to hit like 200 milligrams of caffeine or something. If you're just doing these small ones, there's like 
not a measurable effect. Yeah, um, but now I'm coming across research that points to two milligrams of caffeine has as an effective a dose in terms of ergogenic benefit as six milligrams of caffeine for people. So again, and I have to believe two milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So so even below the typical three to six range that that's out there. Um, well, that's yeah, that's 172 again, for me. So that's still more though than gels and like ca caffeinated gels. I see what you're saying. Like, okay. Because caffeinated gels might have what, 50 milligrams or something like that. Very, very low amount. Uh, in, in my mind, I, I stay away from the caffeinated gels, um, unless they're like a 150, I know SAS has one of those because they are so low. Um, I've done lots and lots of caffeine, a couple tips on it. I really like the mega dose to start and then I carry it in my pocket. And if it's a long race and I'm starting to like have issues, and I can't make it. And there's many hours left, then I'll do another mega dose rather than like keeping it up the whole time that that's worked really well for me watch out for um if you're doing caffeine pills for when the expiration date is because it's like wolf of wall street where it gets delayed at least that's my experience i'm not sure if that's right but at valley of the sun <laughs> i did 600 milligrams before the tt an hour before the tt i did not feel it until an hour after the tt and then <laughs> at 5 p.m that's when it really hit me and i was like oh my goodness yeah uh, and they were a few years old in my bag uh which was not smart and so you could, it, and it totally affects sleep. And when you do these mm -hmm. mega doses, the feeling that I get is you are sitting still, you feel like death, like you're going to die, like you need to move. But if mm -hmm. you're working at like sweet spot somewhere in there, you feel amazing. And I actually get chatty. You probably see me in a long race. I'll like <laughs> talk to you a bunch because I got all this caffeine and I'm like ready to go. Uh, <laughs> and then at, at night, it's just, you can't sleep. But honestly, anyone after an Ironman, like you're not sleeping. It's, mm. it's really weird. You think you're so exhausted, but you have very, very poor sleep. And for an A race like me, I'm going to do a lot of caffeine. Second mm. flip side of this is stage racing. Yeah. I thought about this a ton with Cape Epic. Mm. Because Cape Epic stages would be a perfect place to take caffeine. But uh, I'm thinking I might do a couple pills for like an emergency, but it will disrupt the sleep mm -hmm. and thus make all the other stages harder, which is what I don't want. So probably the last day I will do it. But I'm thinking... Is I know we have those, um, we've, we've seen where beet juice supplementation has similar effects to caffeine. And then when you stack caffeine and beet juice, you don't get an, a further improvement. So I might be doing like the 400 milligrams of like the beat it, um, mm -hmm. the effective dose of like the beat it <clears throat> sport stuff um, to idea. try to get, cause that doesn't make you sleep any worse. And it might be similar. Although I've taken that stuff a lot and I get nowhere near the feeling of mm -hmm. like euphoria and I just added 20 watts to my FTP that I get with caffeine. Another mm -hmm. thing to think about caffeine is that you're listening to this, pay very, very, very close attention to milligrams and grams. Cause if you mess those up and you do these in grams, <laughs> you literally kill yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very dangerous. Yeah. I say important. never buy uh, you can buy like powdered form. And this is popular in like weightlifting that you mix into a drink. Never do that. Cause that is way too easy to mess up the dosage for powder. Just stick, if you're gonna do either gels or um, like a pill where it's usually the pills are 200 milligrams per one. So if, you, if you're if you taking 20 pills or 40 pills, it's pretty easy to figure out like, hey, this is too much. It should be like one or two pills to get 200 or 400 milligrams. Um, you get them in blister packs too. Uh, one, I think no dose, they, sometimes they, they're in blister packs, sometimes they're not. The blister packs are nice because as we said with the salt, you can put them in your pocket. So during the race, you can, you can feel it. And if I was an Ironman, what I'd probably do the swim, I actually don't want to put out too much energy because it's like the, the overcome the resistance of the water, it's exponential. Like it's more than air. Right. So getting that little extra percent really doesn't matter. I would probably start like the swim right before the swim, I would take my caffeine pills. So it would start to hit me outside of the, uh, outside of the swim onto my bike and then just pay really close attention to your bike power meter. Because if you're doing all this caffeine, it's easy to be like, oh, my, my power meter's wrong, especially for an Ironman where you have to run a marathon afterwards. Settle in on that. And then probably during the start of the marathon, I would do another mega dose. And then in between that, I wouldn't do any um, caffeine. But again, mm -hmm. as Chad said, experiment. <coughs> um, what's good for me could just totally annihilate you, send you to the bathroom, be horrible for somebody else.
Yeah, this is a, a I so I and Amber, I know you had a note on this too that it's this really good thing to practice during training and to figure out. So then you can get even like this sort of thing, you'll start to figure out its effect on you. And that's why I didn't take it at Leadville, even though that's a really long event and a really good opportunity to to take in and have benefits from it. But I just had no clue how my body was going to react because I don't take it enough uh, to be able to test through it. Uh, when I do take it, it's usually like the 100 milligram caffeine gels that, that Martin has. Um, but even then, whenever I take those, I get some gut distress, whereas I usually don't, um, just because I'm not used to it. So, uh, yeah. cause I don't drink ca coffee or anything like that. So it's pretty tough for me. Yeah. It's a good thing to figure out about yourself. And I mean, especially, I mean, right now is a great time to experiment, right? Like a lot of events are being canceled. So, you know, even if you were building up to an A event, if it's been canceled and you don't have the consequences for experimenting with this and having a bad outcome are pretty low right now. And it's a great thing to know for yourself going into the future. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, highly recommend just experimenting a little bit with that safely, of course, but, uh, figuring out how your body responds to this stuff is really important. I, for example, it's interesting because I do have, I am homozygous for the fast metabolizing allele for caffeine, but I'm real for some reason, I'm just really, my sleep is really, really sensitive to it. So if I have caffeine usually past noon, it will severely impact my sleep. Um, that's, I have a little bit more of a tolerance and buffer with that if I'm racing. So I can tolerate a little bit more caffeine if I'm racing to your point, Chad, about the effort actually potentially affecting that. But I, I do really need to be careful about that. And you know, if it's one of those races that starts at 3 PM and I know <laughs> I, I probably won't take, especially during a stage race, for example, I won't take caffeine because I the sleep, the benefit of the sleep is so much more valuable than the benefit of the caffeine. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. If you like this video, you should subscribe to our channel. Maybe even give this video a like with a thumbs up and a comment down below. If you want to see race analysis videos, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to get your coaching questions answered, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, which you should, you should go over to trainerroad.com. It'll make you faster. We promise. We guarantee it, right, Nate? Guaranteed. <laughs> or your money back. Yes, it's true, actually. We, we really will do that. Yeah.